going down, man? It's Donnie Houston Podcast. I am Donnie Houston. Check it out, man. We got a very special guest today. When we talk about legendary labels in the South, man, that really came through and uh, did some really, you know what I'm saying, monumental things, man. We talk about UGK. We talk about DJ Screw 3 in the morning. We talk about Point Blank and just a host of others, man. We talk about big time records. And today I'm joined by the CEO, none other. Then Russell Washington, what's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, man? Happy to be here. Man, I'm glad to have you, man. How you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling good. Yeah, yeah. So so what's new, man? Man, on the music end, nothing. Just, as you know, just working on my little YouTube channel and getting ready to uh, rebrand the website and put it back out. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just kind of want to do stuff, uh, me, myself, and I. Yeah, yeah. So less music, but you're doing more real estate now. You're getting into the real estate game now. Yeah, it's definitely. The real estate will be definitely be what we're doing mostly. Yeah. And running the site, you know, kind of dealing with the old stuff just a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you got if you don't take care of your assets, somebody else will. Yeah. So we're going to keep on putting it out there for them to sell it. And on the site, I mean, talk about just some of the things that the people can still get. I know you got the 3 in the morning vinyl going. Or- we got the vinyl. uh Three in the morning vinyl. We got all screwed up vinyl, um, hats, uh, our big time shirts, just all merchandise that's we've done, or, and, and all the old records, you know, the old CDs and tapes, whatever's left in stock. And usually, if you order and we out of stock, we just be like, we shoot your email back and to ask you if you want something else or you want a refund. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what's up. Shout out to Exotic Pop, Exotic Pop Boot. I appreciate y'all coming through. Y'all check out that exotic pop, but um, yeah, man. So let's let's get into the story, man. What is it? What does it really start before big time records? Before all that, are you from Houston? Uh, I'm not from here, but I've been here since the seventh grade. So, oh, yeah. like I'm <laughs> yeah, Houstonian, man. Yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, before big time, I, I had opened the store in '89. So, oh yeah, yeah, I was in King's Flea Market since '89. And uh, that was the first little try at having a business. Not the first business, but the first real business. I had a candy. I sold candy in eighth grade, seventh grade. And in college, I had a meat store because I yeah. knew everybody was hungry. So me and my boy, we worked out something. He worked at the grocery store. We made it happen. Wait, wait. So what high school did you go to? Uh, I went to Westbury High School. So I went okay. to Willow Ridge in ninth grade. Um, we moved out of town to Gary, Indiana. I went to Calumet, and then we came back in 10th grade at yeah. the end. So I went to Westbury, and I graduated from Westbury. Okay. And then for college, where'd you go for college? Texas Southern. TSU. Oh, yeah. TSU oh. alumni. Hey, we oh, in yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. where I graduated from, for sure. What'd you major in? Uh, <laughs> psychology. I didn't finish. Yeah, you finish. Three years, I knew <laughs> I was going to I was going to I opened my business from college. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I opened the, uh, me and my ex-wife, we uh, opened the shop. We were still going to TSU. It was actually in the junior year. Oh yeah. yeah so, so wait, so you were, you said you were selling meat and everything. So you sold meat and everything, and this is how you funded the shop. Or? Nah, man. I okay. t- actually funded the shop, man. I took my student loan. No oh, shit. I had my girl. She believed in the dreams. I was like, you know, add mine and yours together. We in the third year, and we just we set off on our own. Man, okay, so 89, you opened Big Time Records. Is it called Big Time Records? No, the store was actually called Musical Concepts. Hmm. It became Big Time later on, right before we got to do the record. So, okay, Musical Concepts is just like a regular It was a regular store. record store. And yeah. uh, I've been seeing uh, K. Reno, I know you know K. Reno, mm-hmm. and uh, Bookman and them, they had dropped COD, and that was giving me the itch, and then I always would see these other records. I'm like, man, I have a little money saved. I'm going to try. Hmm. So I put up a sign and said, I'm looking for a rap group to produce. Wait, wait, so seeing K. Reno and all of them, that's when you was like, man, I, man let's that's see about doing a label. Yeah, I, could, it, I didn't even think about a label. I just wanted to do one record. No I shit. I wanted to see what it took to do a record. I love COD record, and actually, Dopey was my high school quarterback. We played on the same football team. Hmm. But we that and just seeing K. Reno, I love that record. And I'm like, man, I'm going to try it. So... I put up the sign, and the first person to respond to the sign was Pimp C. Okay. Pimp so, C walked in there with that demo, gave it to my uh, my now ex, and she was blowing me up, and she was like, you got to check out this demo. And I checked it out, and I was ready. Okay, so you don't, So who's the first one that you actually meet within, within Pimp and Bond, or you meet them uh, together? I met Pimp. Okay. Because I think, uh, no, I don't, I don't remember, actually, which one of them I met, but I know I had the demo. And then I think I met Pimp 
And I was like, well, we're going to do it. And But then I met Bun, because me and Bun, back then, me and Bun was like, we was we was riding on buddies, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I was an I-10 hauler, too, so I, yeah. Bun was like my driver. So you, so were you hustling? I know you all hustling. Well, we, we're going to get into that about hustling to make the record. Were you hustling before y'all got into to making the record and all that? I had just started dibbling. Yeah. Yeah. So just had started dibbling a little bit, trying to make some money. Um, and Pimp was the one who told me, man, you should come around this way. No shit. And I was like, man, I think I am. Because at the time I was working with, you know, my brother. And it was, it was never working out right. And I just talked to Pimp, and he was like, man, come out where we at. And then one day I just shit, woke up in the morning <laughs> and went. And just went. And I remember calling Pimp, and he told me where to go, and that's why I met it really everybody, and I just started working. Man, okay, this is amazing. Okay, so what's your, what, is it, what is your impression? Because, I mean, Pimp and Bun, they like 17, 18, 19, somewhere up in there. They pretty young yeah, they, at this time. Well, yeah. I think when Pimp signed – when we agreed, our first contract was handwritten. I think Pimp might have been 16. No shit. Yeah, I didn't even know that, man. But it was like uh, we had the little handwritten agreement, and I wrote it out on a napkin. But thank you, God, that I had enough good in there that it held. Because if it didn't, there wouldn't be no me. Because hmm. I wrote the right amount of words to make it where it holds. So the UGK contract was done on a napkin. It, yeah, basically a nap. It was a sheet of paper because I always walk around with a, uh, I don't know if you ever seen them, the, the little composition notes. Yeah, paper. yeah, for so sure. I've yeah, always yeah. Have, I always got paper because as I was trying to learn how to be in business, they always got to write it down so you know what you're doing. So I, w- I would write down everything, man. And mm. I would always have books, checks, canceled checks in there, everything I do. And um, I had it written and I wrote it out, tried to keep it as simple as possible to make them feel like I ain't trying to jack you. And it was, it was, it was simple. I'm gonna do five records, five years. Hmm. And they, they signed it and I signed it. And actually- Wait, where did you get your knowledge to even know that, okay, we need to do a five album deal. We need to do this type of thing, you know? All guessing. No shit. It was all guessing, but I had seen, I'm a, I'm a avid movie watcher. And I had always seen, I had seen in this movie that uh, I don't know what it was like some movie, but I I'd heard it it really worked. It was legal. If you write out something and everybody signs, it's a binding you, contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, basically a binding contract. And uh, I I wrote the shit out right there, standing by the car, and then I got it typed up because I was always be on the computer typing. We typed it up, printed out on the printer, and we all signed it. Okay, so tell me this: what, What's your impression of like a young pimp seeing a young bum be when you first meet him? If you had to describe them like their personalities, man, and all I that. thought they was the greatest dudes in the world. Hmm. And uh, my dreams really expanded after meeting them. I dreamed of us being independent, pimp over the music, you know, bun doing the solo, pimp doing the solo, and um, just being more of an integral part of big time, you know. So it was. Uh, if you had to describe their, their their personalities or like them as like characters, how would you say like Bun was this type of person, Pimp was this type of person? I would say Pimp was a little more um, arrogant, <laughs> just like. <laughs> but one thing, he's very straight shooter. Yeah. You know, if he if he say he meant it, yeah. and that was always it. But it was very early off. I could tell the dynamic of the group was Pimp was more kind of calling the shots, but I think that was based on the fact that he did the music. Yeah. So, you know, he got the power because the music is starting right there. Yeah. So, you know. But from my understanding though, they were still, they weren't the two man UGK when they when y'all first met them, right? Mm-hmm. They were still like three it, or four of them. four of them. But I still only had been met, met Pimp and Bun, but I knew of the other ones and I, I think I met a couple of them gradually. I know it was Mitchell Queen, another dude. Jalen uh, Jackson, I believe his name was. I, I always met Bird. So mm-hmm. I, he didn't rap, but he was the DJ. And uh, I met Mitch and the other dark skinned dude. I always forget his name. But Jalen. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. he went to play football. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then by the time we got to the recording, it was just me, Pimp, and Bun. Hmm. And, you know, and but I, by this time, y'all hanging tight every day, y'all in PA. Me and Bun every day, yeah. Because mm. Bun worked at the store, correct? Bun worked at the store. Okay. Bun was my driver. Yeah. If he, you know, they always talk about the work they did. Yeah. Don't tell the real work was you was a driver. 
get, get me there and get me back. That was it. Hmm. And, and, you know, I extremely, Bun was my first right-hand man. Whenever, when I went make the cover, when I was talking to Robert, you would always see Bun there. That's why it was, it was kind of shocking when he was saying these things that you're like, well, hold up, buddy. He was right there, <laughs> you know? That's why I'm, I'm having the way I say artists will be like, they'll say these things that just, it's not true. But I think if you say something long enough, you believe it. You just start changing the narrative. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, I work on the record, but uh, was it at some point y'all like ran out of money working on the record or something? We, it wasn't that. that, that the first thing where we started having money problems was I had opened another shop. So you got two stores now? I had two stores. Are they both in Kings? Or? No, one is in Kings. The other one was in K Bargain Center. K Bargain, across yeah. Across town, yeah, in the yeah, north side. Yeah. But uh, at the time, being a young man and uh, not really knowing my, uh, my first wife had a spending habit. So when you're balancing a checkbook, you're thinking of what you're spending. You're not thinking of two people spending. And so we had a big account with Southwest Wholesale because we had been selling a lot of records. And uh, we got a little behind. So my first thing was the fastest way to make that money up and continue doing what I'm doing. It's just going to, you know, Get out there. drive down the street. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So I started that little mission and, you know, it was going. Yeah. So is, is Pimp hustling at the same time? You said Bones is driving. Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. That is bullshit. <laughs> okay. And they they told that story, and I'd be like, "Where's where did this happen?" <laughs> I'm working, bun driving. We never saw pimp, and the honest truth is, the only time pimp showed up where we hustled at was the day to ask him tell me that the real money is to put out our record. Hmm. So when you gonna stop doing all this junk and put our record out? And I said, "Man, you know what? I'm done." So Pimp was trying to talk you out of hustling and do more focus on the music. After he realized that I was going to the dark side more. Because as far as I, at that, before that conversation and the conversation I was having with my wife, I was like, this is a much easier mission right here. Yeah. So you get into the game and you're like, shit, this is easy money. <laughs> man, yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 I mean, you got to talk about this era because at this yeah. time, you know, hey, man. Yeah, but if I could have seen the future and realized <laughs> how many people I used to see balling, that just disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> I would have been like, oh yeah, I went the right way. But sure, I was getting talked to on a lot of ends of what I was doing, that this is the way you need to go. You know, from the, you know, the people you deal with, right, right, right. they're like, man, you doing it. Why would you go? I'm like, man, nah, I'm November. I said, I edged it in stone, I promised my wife. And I told Pimp, in November, I'm done. So I just went on until November. And this then is I November 91? This is 19, November of 1991. Because hmm. we put out the record in February 17th of 1992. Yeah. So after that, we was all full-fledged running around trying to get this record done. And uh, it was cool. But I am thankful to Pimp, man, for even coming up there. Because it was shocking when they said he wanted to talk to me where I was. Because I'm like, hmm, he don't never be here. But you know how he was. He he say what's on his mind, what he feel, and he was right. And so he, he saying, came in there kind of like give you like a talking to, like man, yeah, really, <laughs> like he was my daddy. When you gonna say his exact words was when you gonna stop doing all this bull? I, the money is our record, mm. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I felt him a little bit because I was getting pressure already from my wife. She was like, well, when you gonna stop? Because you know, a man can't be gone every day, and I'm gone every day. Stay a couple days in PA, come back here. So. Might be here an hour, hour and a half. I'm back yeah. going to PA. It was basically like I was living there. So that ain't good for no relationship. Yeah, yeah. So she wanted me back, and and I, I was ready to go on and chill anyway. And then he told me that. I was like, man, because we, we had started, stopped, and it was time to go on and get it going. Yeah. You know? So so when they when they get into it or when they really get into working on the record, are you going to the studio with them or they kind of just handling yeah, the I'm studio? Going. Okay. I'm going. Talk about some of them sessions, man. Like just some things man, you remember the from the first time. ones were tragic because <laughs> you go and uh, we went. We actually went to the studio. I don't remember the name. It was a nice studio, man. The dude had a real nice setup. It was like okay, this is the spot, and we was doing it, but he couldn't get the sound how Pimp wanted it. So Pimp was already like veto. 
Then we tried another homeboy stuff. A but little, Pimp is making all the beats and everything, right? He making the beats. Yeah. But you, when you make the beat, you still got to lay that can. beat down. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, the yeah. engineer got to be able to make your vision come true. sound has to yeah. sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at that time, I'm sure we wasn't that experienced. I think it was like we was in the real studio. I think everything else had been on Pimp's four track. So taking that vision from the four track to the to studio, man, we I think we went one, two... We went like three or four places before we finally found the place that we could work and it was coming out the way Pimp wanted it. And that was a track designer, Shatoro Henderson, hmm. in Mo City. So I don't know, somebody told us about him and we went over there and it worked out, thank goodness, because the, the first studio with the good stuff, we got it, he Pimp didn't like it. Then the second time, the dude was recording it. We was It was a smaller studio, a little in-house studio. The dude was recording, laying down the stuff. And then all of a sudden he he said, oh man, he busts out laughing. And we like, what's going on? He said, man, I just erased it all. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's what? what Pimp, so Pimp immediately was like, man, Russ, man, bump him. We out of here. And we was out of there. And that's when the next place was Shatoro's place. And we was able to start really getting, we finally got that first song done. I was the happiest guy in the world. What was, was the first one y'all did? Uh, I think the first song, the first completed song was Cocaine in the Back of the Ride. Hmm. The one with the uh, WC sample. And it was ironic that that one was the first one because it was basically a WC. Me and Bun used to jam every day. That's the, if you look at our uh, cassette, um, um, the little cover, it's exactly the size of WC and Mad Circles because that's what we took to the printer and said, can you make one of these? Mm. And so the first song we completed had that sample in it, that cocaine in the back of the ride. And then we started getting them done. And they was, Shatora was a good engineer. Him and his, uh, he had a wife named Bernie. They was, they was nice people. Yeah. He was able to, and um, I recorded a couple records there, actually. Yeah. The first records. Yeah, talk about uh, talk about when y'all made "Tell Me Something Good." Well, "Tell Me Something Good" was my favorite song on the demo. Off top. Off top. It was just a whole nother song. It was about uh, some dude who shot somebody and killed him or something. He did something and killed, shot the wrong person. And because the song was real positive at first, "Tell Me Something Good," I heard, and I they kept not wanting to do it. I think the dude heard, got wind of it, and told Pimp, he was like, man, you can't do it. Man, why you gonna do me like that? So Pimp came in saying he didn't want to do it. Hmm. And I was like, well, man, if that song not on it, I don't want to do it. And we in it, we starting. <laughs> I'm like, this been the song I've been jamming. So you knew that was the one off top? I knew it was to me. Yeah. <laughs> I loved it from the moment I heard it. It was what made me sign them. It made me want to work with them. Actually, I loved everything on that demo. So were they, were they signed at the time when y'all did the demo or y'all just kind of just cool and going to the studio? I don't remember, but the, the signing, I think we, we had already signed a little hand. We had the handwritten agreement signed because if Jive signed us, we had to go back and get a real contract because yeah. Jive was like, it was enough to hold them, but it wasn't enough for Jive to want to put their money down yeah. on that deal. So that's when I came back and I did my second contract um, I think it, I was still scared to try and make it be a lot more. One of like job contract was like 69 pages. Yeah. So I went to 12. Yeah. And so that was a bigger contract, but we were still all love. So where you, where you getting, where you getting the game from with the contract to say, okay, we, this is what goes in a 12 page contract. Man, I read, uh, I read like a couple books. Uh, I tried to read a book from an artist's perspective and a company's hmm. and then match the stuff that makes sense to me because everybody got their different opinion of how it should go so on that second contract i just went to uh another lawyer and uh i think it was warren fitzgerald the cert same guy i used to start my case against you he um he just gave me a more upgraded contract i'm sure he some standard he pulled off but enough to cover me and job was comfortable with it and you know, we moved on. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, talk about because Tell Me Something Good comes out, and that is, like, instant, like, so it was just, it was fire off top. You know what I mean? Like, it came out and it went, man. Like, talk about just that instant success. Man, um, what we did, we had finished the record. I w we didn't have wax. We didn't have a radio edit. 
we didn't know. We, like I said, we are winging it. I mean, when you think of three dudes just winging it, we just thinking is that's it, what you're supposed and is, to try. And is it big time records already? It's big time records, yeah. Okay, so tell me this. When y'all did big time, because I think I was reading, I don't know if it was Julia Beverly's book or something, but was it ever any time where it was this was supposed to be like a three man thing because y'all all hustled together and it was supposed to be? No. That's not the case? Absolutely okay. not. If it was supposed to be a three man thing, like I tell everybody, I ain't no dummy. I don't have to make all the money to feel good, but I know how to make a bunch of pieces to get what I need. What idiot is gonna give up? I'm not gonna be partners with Pimpsy and Bumby. If them my partners, I'm the happiest dude in the world. Yeah. Cause we gonna ride all them beats gonna be fine. I'm gonna put out independent records on them. We would have never signed if we was partners. Cause my vote would have always been no. Hmm. But what it was is they weren't my partner, but I always treated them like it's us in it. Even when we voted, do we want to sign with Jive? Do we want to stay independent? Or do we want to go with Polygram? I even, we even threw in there because Jay had called me, said, do you want to go and rap a lot? And I said, for me, it is who offered the most money. And that's what I was gonna ask because this is like after Rap a lot is you know they didn't had their success and you know mind playing tricks just <laughs> yeah. came out like they the label in the city you know what I mean yeah they the label in the city but it's just it's different when you got those people from New York telling me for my first record the bidding was already at that time it was up to close to one forty five one fifty for UGK hmm. I talked to Jay I talked to Jay for at least an hour and a half on the phone not once. Did he say he was gonna match the figure? Cause if he would have matched the figure, I would have thought about it. You know, this is way before I've ever heard some of the other stuff. So I'm just looking like, who gonna give me the most out of this deal? Polygram and Jive fighting. And if I could have waited a little bit longer, Jive was gonna give me the same deal that Master, not uh, Master P got, uh, E40. No got. shit. He said, we gonna get, I, cause I kept saying I wanted to stay independent. Cause I, I'm in control of my control, masters, right, right, right. And I, I ain't had nobody changing my beats. And I'm down with Robert. And Robert, going, me and Robert, we working good. I think we was doing good. We sold 40,000 tapes. See, and, and we got to talk months. about this, too, because I was reading that y'all were, you know, Southwest Wholesale wasn't a distribution company. They were no, one-stop. They were one-stop. Y'all were the ones who came to the table as mm -hmm. far as the hip-hop record. And, and Robert felt like, I got to do this young dude a favor. Are we going to distribute his record? And Robert said he did, you know, if I've heard, he, he didn't really believe in the record. But I had bought so many records because my little store was banging in the flea market, man. Don't, I was making, knocking a couple grand a week because mm. we, I, I was into rap. I can find a tape. All I got to do is find three good songs on there because um, when a person is listening to a tape, all he going to ask you to do is flip. And then some of them going to try and be smart and say, flip to the next song. Go back one. Just trying to see if that is jamming enough for him to give you that money. So I had already figured it out how to click. <laughs> so I go, I listen to the tape in my car first when I buy the new album, and I'm gonna click you. And then when CDs came out, it was even better because I knew what song to go to. Right. So, I so, so, uh, and see, that's what I'm saying. This was a different time. People would actually come in and be like, "What's hot? What's whatever?" What's hot? Hey. And if, the, if your word was good, and you didn't sold them some jam and stuff, and in my store, once I realized they couldn't arrest me for playing the cursing, we played cursing all the time. I've been warned, I've been threatened with tickets by the cops, but I talked to my neighbors and they didn't, they didn't trip on me. So I've always been able to just fight through. Yeah. And we play, I'm letting you hear right now, what's going on, what's on this record? And they'll be like, bet. That's, how, that's actually how Reg and FX heard the UGK and asked me, y'all got a single? I said, no, <laughs> not yet. We, we gonna get to it. He was like, man, when you get it, Give me, gave me his number, he said, you get it to me. And sure, when we did it, you know, and uh, he actually was the one who put us in that show. Yeah, the show, where they had to call in it, yeah, mm -hmm. and vote for it, yeah, yeah. And we got it, we got so many calls when they played it the first time that they played it the second time. But they weren't giving us no movement, they wasn't. The person who really blew UGK out the water was jamming Jimmy O. Hmm. Jamming Jimmy O, Charles uh, Washington Screws old manager. Mm -hmm. I don't know how me and Charles went to college together, so we knew each other from back then. Cause, and um, I had got him the record, and I think he brought it to Screw, and then he was the one who got it. 
and he was with me or he was with it. I you know you I don't remember the exact story, but all I know is we got that record to Jimmy O and Jimmy O was, was like, I'ma blow you up. Mm. And shit, his word was good as gold. He started playing it. Cause that's when we had the two radio stations, which was the greatest thing for the city to have two different things about two different perspectives of what they want to play. Yeah. Cause yeah. the box had the record. They saw all those calls for the record. And you know, when you first start and shit, you know, you call them, right, we call right. them, the whole staff call <laughs> right, them. Right, right, and, right. and they'll, they'll tell you, oh yeah, we're going to get that right home. They played 26 songs in a 24 hour day period. They slipped maybe one or two tracks in there. They got a list. They're not going to break that list. And even if they playing one local, now I know, they playing one local, that's it. They yeah. might squeeze two. You know, they throw a little bit more, but if you go to other places, that's all you're going to hear is they locals, but not here. Yeah. We play everybody in the world stuff. We don't really play ours. Yeah. Man, we've been, we go to Memphis, we hear Memphis music. We in Atlanta, we hear Atlanta music. And uh, we just, uh, Jimmy O came and he said, and I always laugh, he said, you know, he didn't ask me for no money. He didn't ask me for nothing. He said, man, when I blow you up, man, I want y'all to do me a promo show. And being an inexperienced, I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I tell you, when me and Pimp and Bun drove up to 9.9 .9 and we saw all the damn <laughs> people, we was looking at each other. We was like, ah, we took our first little, mm. Yeah, yeah. But we, he still did what he said he was going to do, so he deserved what he got. But you're not, you're not thinking that's going to be that when somebody say, it's like we I do a record that come to you, you be like, Man, I'm gonna help you out, I'm gonna help promote you. Give me a free show. Yeah. Okay. You no don't problem. expect to walk up yeah. there. It's packed the, you the like, club. man, we didn't miss a whole bunch of money. <laughs> Not a whole bunch of money. I mean the club was wall to wall. Mm. And you like who you that, that was my first time saying, Who are these all these people here to see? So y'all so so y'all didn't really have a real uh idea of just how mm -mm. No we had no clue. We had did a, I think at that time, I think we had did a first show. And I'm going to tell you how cool we was, man. We did a show in Louisiana, I think. I want to say we got like a hundred and something dollars. And I remember me, Pimp, and Bun standing there. And I'm telling them, I'm good. I don't know, but Pimp broke it down and gave me a little piece of the hundred and something dollars, enough to give me some Whataburger, I think, and they got their Whataburger money, but we made a hundred and something dollars for our first show. Oh, man. And we did it out the car, but we was, we was tight, man. It was just unbelievable. I would have never thought if somebody would have said, I'm gonna give you a million dollars if you knew how this story gonna end. I would have never thought that. Mm. I honestly thought we would have worked together forever. Yeah, so when y'all when y'all was selling uh, through Southwest, how many, how many units did y'all sell before y'all go to jail? 40,000. 40,000. 40, cassettes. 40,000. In 60 days. Ooh. 60 days. So Six, 60 we, days later, y'all do the deal with Jive? Yeah, after we got the CDs out. Two months later, y'all do a deal? Man, come we on, do. man. But I'm going to tell you the craziest thing, man. You remember that label, Nasty Mix? Yeah. Sir Mix a yeah. label? Yeah, If I told you we dropped that record, one day they sent me a fax to sign us. What? One day. Fifteen thousand dollars they offered us. <laughs> I was like, hmm. Yeah, we get fifteen on the first it. day. Then, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I think we gonna get that. I was like, that's out. Nasty Mix was the first label that called. Didn't Def Jam uh, call? Um, it Polygram. Polygram. You know, okay. It was Polygram. I don't know if it was a sub label or not, but it was Polygram. Polygram was the first one. Polygram actually was the one that w they wanted us because they was the one made that money go up. Cause I think the first offer was 15 and I don't remember what, what job was Barry Wise was calling. And then I remember when he realized Polygram was in it. And as the record got hotter and I kept saying no, cause I was starting to look at those numbers. I'm like, Hey man, we gonna sell a lot of records. Cause we had all them samples, nothing had been changed. And it was like, shit. I'm good. I, my vote was always independent. Hmm. And then Robert and them was like, I remember he said he took, he took a little small number, a hundred, something to call back in a couple of days, give me another hundred. Then I, by the time we signed with Jive, Robert was like, give me 5,000. He's like, give me 5,000 over here. And them was bled. Hmm. And then I did Robert a solid. I said, man, 
look, I had sold to people on my own because I was shipping it from my house. And um, people weren't paying. And I was like, man, they not going to pay me, Robert. But they going to pay you. Yeah. So when we sign, I'm going to give you my receivables. And you can you pay me for the receivables and let them pay you. And if you want the markup, I don't remember what the markup was, but I told him, I said, you know, you can keep a markup, you know. But I don't think he did. I think he just took it upon himself because they was the ones distributing to everybody. And we, we was doing good. And then I remember going, getting kidnapped and going to New York, and they kept us there two days. And uh, I said, that's where the inexperience caught up with me. You say you say getting kidnapped. What you mean? Because we want we supposed to go that one day talk and come back, but they got us in the office and they didn't hold no guns to our head. But they said stay one more day, and that's if we'd have left, they knew that we wasn't coming back because the group was really bubbling. They was going. They kept us that extra day. We signed, and you know another thing was they say I'm this this guy that's cheating. Them. What dude cheats you and takes your mama with him? I took their mama with me to New York to sign. Why she want her king? She didn't come. She but, didn't put okay, a dollar so, in the movie. She wasn't their manager at that point. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's, it's crazy. I took her. She was right there. And it was never, she never thought we was going to do nothing. She even said, I think she said in the book, she didn't, she thought we was just bullshitting. She even told him that dude too young. He 20 something years old. He ain't going to do shit. You know, actually, the word she said was that end ain't going to do nothing. <laughs> and I kept saying, no, we, I think we're going to get it. And the lack of experience, we had to wing a lot of things, but I think we got it. Yeah. And the only money we left on the table on that first record was the CDs because mm-hmm. we never pressed up in it. That could have easily been double the money because CDs was just starting to come around there. Yeah. You know. But, so, so, okay. So when y'all meet with Jive, this is off of the Southern way. This is the Southern they way. They tell y'all what they want to do. They they want to redo the album. They want to. Mm-hmm. What, what are they proposing to y'all? Um, they proposing. Um, I think we we signed. Yeah, we signed with Jive for uh, one fifty. Okay. It was is this a is this a big time records deal or is this a this UGK is deal? A big time. It's a big time records for the services of UGK. It's a production deal. Okay. And so, it's it's they 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 want to sign them. By then they had to beat Polygram. They got to 150. I think Polygram was stuck at 145, 148. Just right. It wasn't much difference until Jive started dangling that uh, that distribution deal where we're gonna get to be distribute our own products. Which if I had been in the game longer, I would have held out for that because that put me in a whole different ball game. Hmm. And uh, but the group, somebody, I don't know who. Somebody from Jive or somewhere told them they was going on tour with Too Short and uh, TLC. And I remember Pimp, we was outside of Bun's house talking about what we're going to do. And he was like, Russ, I'm going to be Pimp. This is Pimp saying, Russ, we're going on tour with that girl that wear them condoms on her eyes. Man, he was so excited. That's what, so his vote instantly was Jive. Bun voted Jive. I had voted independent. But... At the time, even though we wasn't our partners and I wasn't when handling them like that, I said, okay, let's go with job. I mean, why I'm, I wasn't tripping because I'm finna walk over and get a bag. And then when we got there to get me more in it because that job knew I wasn't committed, they gave me 25000 for the next artist. Hmm. I said, I don't have him. they like, you young. We think you're going to get another one in. And thank God that it took me just a couple more years before I found Screw. Or they would have had it because they even on matter of fact, even on when I turned in Blank's album, because I recorded Blank's album right as I was finishing the f- complete album of UGK. Mm. So I recorded them two albums at the same time. So you, you're working on Point Blank and uh, Too Hard to Swallow at the same time. Yeah, because we had finished the Southern Way, but we had to record six or seven more songs to make it an album. Right. And then when I met Blank in the process. How, how do you meet Point Blank? Ah, he showed up somewhere. <laughs> All I know is he gave me a demo, and that demo was prone to bad dreams. Hmm. It was meant, only th- prone to bad dreams was point blank demo except one song. It was one song we couldn't get the clearance from, so we wasn't able to pull it off. And I wanted that song. I, you know, I'm listening to because when I would get demos back then, I would ride with them, and it's crazy. Even people, a lot of people don't even know my second group I signed actually was the Sex Fiends. Hmm. 
Hmm. I signed them. I was actually trying to do them and UGK the Southern way at the same time, but they was called twice as nice. Hmm. They was in my apartment, Bun and them was in my house, and I remember that I was not going to be able to afford to do both. And so me and my wife talked, and I was, we was like, who we go with? Because I liked the, uh, twice as nice as a demo too. But I liked the UGKs a lot more. Yeah. And then I kept thinking of, I would hear ideas, and then me and Bun was so cool. Because we, we together basically 24 hours. At the hours store and everything, and y'all hustling. The and store, this. on the road. I'm camping in a PA in the room. Shit, Bun, on, we in the double bed. Bun over there doing what he do. I'm over here doing what I do. And we chill. We, it ain't no way. Bun was like, I always, after that, had a chief officer. I called a chief officer, my right hand man. Bun was my right hand man before I even know what the word was for it. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it was like, we, I was going to do whatever. It was pretty much gonna always be they to them two votes was gonna be against my vote, and you know, and that was it. We went with Jive. So man, okay. So when y'all uh, y'all get to Jive, what's the, what's the first like sign of like? Eh, I don't really know if we made the right decision. Man, to me, and I'm not speaking bad on the dead. R.I.P. Miss West. When Miss West saw that money come across the table and did the math, that's exactly what it was. She's sitting here, she, you know, you're seeing a 23-year-old dude, you know, pretty much getting a hundred and some thousand dollars, almost two hundred thousand dollars, and this was right here. But something can be right there and you not see it. This, it ain't no way. That's my son. I know all my kids. I got three kids. I know every one of their talents, and I know what they can do. And there's no way my child making music in there because he was making beats before I met him. Hmm. He had beats already, the equipment in his room. I would have saw him and been like, hey, let me holler at you, son. Come here. I'm going to put this record out because they could have easily did it. I know they could have because when Pimp bought his first his drum machine in Houston after we getting going, dude brought $500 worth of quarters. Hmm. I was like, how you got $500 worth of quarters, he said. My parents said the vending machine. They can run the yeah. vending machines. So I'm not gonna say it's embezzlement, but one of them vending machines or two of them was light. If you got five hundred dollars worth of quarters, that's the way I know. But he he bought that. So if she, if she, if she believed in it like that before I came along, why you didn't do it yourself? You heard the same songs I said heard, and even Pimp said in his book, he said I don't know what Russ heard. If I, when I go back and listen to the demo, that shit was trash. But not to me. When I heard it, I was like, shit, this, this is it. it. Yeah. And I kept saying, this is the songs we're going to use, and this going to go. And it wasn't until that money, it was that, it was that money to me, and I made a bad mistake because Pimp had started getting a little, doing some stuff, and we was at a show, and he started complaining about the accommodations all the time. And so at that time, the, the booking, the dude who was doing his booking, he was always getting sad. He was like, man, you know, pimp be tripping, man. We got to keep upgrading on the hotels, but we're not getting no money for these shows. So that hotels and travel, it's all coming out of my pocket. So we like, hey, man, you know, you want to stay here, bro? What's wrong with this place? This place cool. He don't want to stay there. And then, you know, I'm not going to say no names, but birds in the city that's pretty big in his ear infringing on my contract, which they shouldn't be, but it's just, it's nothing new. That's just been going on forever. And then the next thing, you know, I'm talking to him and I'm saying, hey, man, I heard you are uh, supposed to be in this certain group in town. What? And he like, man, that's my business. What is it? I'm not signed as a solo artist. I'm in the group. Wait, this is Pimp? Yeah. So he joined another group? Uh, it was speculation that he was going to sign a very big group, but I won't say their name. Hmm. Biggest group in town at the time. Okay. <laughs> so... Me and him talking, and, and, and the older Russ is a different Russ from a younger Russ. The younger Russ, you know, I'm in the streets. I was in school. I was that dude that you kind of, I wasn't mild-mannered. I was quiet, but when the snapping point come, it was SOS, smash on sight. So me and Pimp getting into it. He's already beefing about the rooms. Now I just found out you just behind my back saying you're going to be in this group. How, why is you even over there talking? And so Pimp was like, 
I don't want to talk no more. And he was like trying to rush past me. And when I, I don't know what happened, but my first reaction when he was rushing past me was like, no. And I pushed him. I'm a little stronger than him. So he flies into the closet and hits his head. It's not funny. He starts crying. And I'm like, oh, shit. I didn't mean to push him that hard. So Bun is like, no, oh, he like stepping in between him, Bun and Bird, thinking I'm gonna hit him, but I never was gonna hit him. I never meant to push him that hard. It, it was just, just a the, reflex, it was a reflex yeah. from the things happening. Cause the way he rushed, I know he was just like rushing past me. But it's already but it heated. Looked like he, it, we heated and it looks like he rushing to me. So I just push him. And pretty much like, you know, I would mark that as the day that by then, once he go tell his mama being, you know, he, close with his mama mamas protect their kids so the first thing is i know then that you want me gone it's no way because you would think that after that that sense and the next time he do something i'm gonna be whipping on him or getting him whipped and that was never in my mind it was just a reflex and wait so y'all weren't having any i mean other than like the little accommodation things it wasn't anything like any other tensions really building it was just y'all had this one nah, moment let me tell you dog this happens. these boys I asked to be bought out of that contract. They begged me not to leave. Their mama had, it was- This is mama, after the incident. This, this, no, this is even, this is right before we, yeah, we haven't signed yet, so it's before the incident. They mom wanted them, she had met, because managers and stuff were sneaking down the PA, talking. And I'm like, where's all these people? How they finding y'all? So the mom was trying to get them another man. So she called me and she said, I want you to be co-managers with this dude. I'm like, I done did the work. What, he, what is he managing? What is he going to bring to the table? And I'm like, who does he manage? He didn't have no good names. So that means if you ain't bringing something bigger to the table, you just trying to catch on and infringe on mine. So I said no. And then I told Pimp. I said, I do not want to do it. They said, if, Pimp said, if you don't do it, Russ, we ain't doing it. They was, they, was, they was down. But when it came to the money, I think that his mom seeing you the get money. That, seeing you get that much money. You think. And get the extra. Yeah. And then I made the mistake of being a young dude. I broke down all the money and paid them a percentage. So when we sitting at the Even table, the money you got to make the other albums and all that. The money I got to make, uh, I didn't know about that until we was at the table, yeah. but I had broke down what we was making from Southwest. They part of the 150 uh, to get signed and they asked me, Jive said, are you gonna get him any? Cause Jive knew that that's just a recording budget. That really ain't your half money. You gotta record the album. I wasn't thinking like that. I was thinking like, this is all our money that we're getting right now. And uh, they asked me, you know, what you gonna give them? I said, I'm giving them 32,000 some dollars. And- This is each or the split? No, it's a split okay. for the record. And uh, that was their first royalty. Them dudes said, he only paying us for what Jive signing. Cause it came from Jive right there. But Jive asked, and when I said the amount, my attorney said, that's too much. And that was my first royalty statement. I didn't know, I don't even think I even took out enough deductions. I just, I just like, okay, the, the numbers say this, give them that. So they both got 16,000 something dollars. And they instantly took that as I was cheating them. Hmm. And that, man, I remember coming on the plane, the only guy that invested, was on the plane with me and he said, shit just starting. And I said, what? He said, man, it's just starting, it's gonna get worse. He f foreseen it, but he was a street dude too. He saw it hmm. and, and it got worse. They, they, didn't like the, they didn't like my first office. They said, it's too big. They wrote about it in the book. I heard about that, that yeah. you ain't got some elaborate office or something like <laughs> that. No furniture, hmm. no furniture. We had two desks in that office. It was too big, it was too big, but I'm dreaming I'm dreaming you think further. You thinking like, thinking man, like, in the game man, we're gonna now, put a studio it's only there. up from here. Yeah. yeah, it's, I'm like, it's, what can happen? Yeah. I went in that office 
four months before I was begging my lease people to let me out my lease. Uh, you know, this 1992, that office was like close to a stack a month. But it was it was big, all windowed office on the corner of the arena towers. But we didn't have it decorated. We didn't have nothing. But it was still enough to make people on the outside looking in jealous. And that's exactly, I got three deaths in this office. One for the dude who booked them, my desk, and the one for the secretary. That's it. And then this old, big old, a big old empty space, big old empty space, nothing. Yeah. But it was enough that the mom wrote about it in the book. It's elaborate, he's sitting up all back in this seat. It's regular desk, office furniture, it wasn't even leather. No marble, nothing, it was nothing fancy. It was just a dude, a person who just got 150, who still have a business making $1,000 a week. It was nothing, it was nothing. Yeah. But you live and learn and it was, that, that was another thing that bothered them. Yeah. Oh, and I bought a truck off the showroom floor. Hmm. That was a big thing for them. It didn't matter there was a Ford Anaheim conversion, <laughs> but to them it was something special. Yeah. I don't even know. So I think they just never took into consideration my other hustles. So they both, because I mean, you, you, yeah, you and Pimp have the physical altercation, but you were saying you and Bun were already tight. Did, did yeah, that... a, actually Bun, Bun was signed to Big Time Records and Ironclad Management. Pimp was the first one complained about the management. I let him out. I said, you out of management. Cause somebody had told him, you know, somebody probably on the other side of town here had told him, oh, a rec company can't manage the artists. Right, the artists. Right, right. Even though if you look mostly at that time, everything we looked in said the, the artist was managed by the, the record companies. It's just, you know, so I said, okay, I'm keeping everything aboard. I, re I faxed them the release straight from my office. And uh, Bun, Pimp wanted to holler at Bun. So he said he going to PA for a couple of days. That give him all day. So now he, the only voice he hearing. And I remember he called me, he said, Big time, they got you. I said, got me what? I said, I'm not worried. I ain't done nothing. And then later when I'm talking to his mom. He said they got you, what yeah, you mean like they got they you? They found some dirt on me. Mm. And later on, when it comes to it, the mom the stepdad is talking to me and pimp. And I said, man, just show me one thing that I cheated from you. You have not cheated us in one way, but the way your contract is worded, you can get us later. So you beefing with me about something, you know, I guess they're doing like the minority report, wherever Tom Cruise, where you go get the dude right. for future crimes. So they were saying in the future, I could get them. And that, and that was it. It was, it was just, it was all gone from there. It was, it was really just, it was gone and I could not never turn the thing back. But the biggest, the biggest nuisance with us was the video director who shot Tell Me Something Good, a crook that they later years really knew it was a crook because they was all on tax evasion and shit. He was in their ear the minute we started shooting the video. Hmm. Cause we was beefing in cause Pimp showed up a day late, made us cost us $8,000. He missed the first day of the video shoot. We got an eight thousand, seven thousand nine hundred and ninety some dollar charge. Plus, I bought everybody who came pimping them, all they boys, all my boys, point blank, my right hand man. I bought everybody brand new tennis shoes. Hmm. I spent a thousand dollars. The Jive said they brought money for clothes. They wanted that to wear, and the lady from Jive was like, "No." She was like, "No." She got their clothes. And uh, I know Blank and my uh, right hand dude, they snuck in, got them an outfit. But the tennis shoes, she wasn't doing it. And then Jive, I told Jive, I said, so if I pay for it, y'all reimbursing me? They said, yeah. So I bought everybody, I spent like $1,200 in Foot Locker. You know, this is 1992. Yeah, yeah. We ain't getting no Jordans. Yeah. If it had been Jordans, I never would have bought it. Yeah. But we all got tennis shoes, and Jive never reimbursed me, the motherfuckers. Hmm. But you know, that was, I think that was a big problem. Birds, man. People tell me. But, but see, even with the video, because y'all shot the video, but it didn't come out until like later on. <laughs> Cause nobody played the motherfucker. That's just seventy thousand dollars was in the wind. I don't even. And then by then, Byron Hill weasel way his way in. Who the, became the, the new manager? Director, right, he right, became right. their manager. Yeah. And he kept telling them all this stuff. He also was the one who told them how to stipend money. But when we started recording the second album, he was the one. He knew some stuff. 
uh, he just didn't use it for good. He he was the one. If you look at our second royalty statement, and they always talk about I I was sticking it to them. They stuck it to me, cause Pimp didn't get paid no extra to do the Southern way. He did them tracks, but on all of a sudden when it come to the next album, you see Pimp My Pen in the National. You see Dream Higher. Who the hell is these people? I say who is these people you paying? But now I know who that was. That was Pimp getting extra money out the budget, and that was Bun. And whatever Burns company name, because it was company names I didn't know on the statements. And uh, on the second album, I didn't get a dime of that first recording budget. I never touched, I never touched any. Wait, 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 so, okay. But by the second album, though, I mean, it was pretty bad between y'all. Yeah, it's, it's beef, yeah. yeah. but this the killer part. Now they talk about we was partners. At this point, I said, man, look, what is the beef? I said, y'all so worried about how much money I make? I'm going to make us 50-50 partners. I sent the, that thing into Jive, facts, that I'm going to give them 50% of whatever money comes from Jive. Jive, you pay them, and you pay me. I don't want to touch the money. I'm thinking this is my solution. To, there you go. You worried about what I'm going to do with the money? There's no touching. I sent Jive that. They signed it because they needed this to be done for the next album to come out. Jive sent me a $50,000 check. I got a $50,000 check one day, opened the FedEx. I remember me and Eddie, we was there at the office early because we knew it was coming. Yeah. Whenever we know some change coming, we in the office. We ain't going to miss that money. Yeah. Man, we in there at 8 o'clock, man, because <laughs> yeah. we, we was actually room dogs because we had a, we, I had a condo, and me and him, he one side, I'm one side. So me and Eddie there, FedEx knock, straight to the bank. We go into the bank, we do our thing. The next morning, we in there working, another knock on the door. FedEx. I'm like, hmm, this weird. Open that. Letter from Zamba. Due to sections such and such, such and such of our 70-page contract, you did not turn the album in in a timely manner. It, 18 songs. Even, this is the day after I got 18 songs submitted, 18 songs uh, took, and paid a check. So I'm, I'm like, you got the album. But it had a section in the contract. If I do not deliver the album in a timely manner, UGK can replace me on the contract. Hmm. And that was the most bitter pill to swallow because if, you, if they replace me on the contract, they go from a production deal to an artist deal. So not only did you want me out so bad, you gave, we had a 14 point production deal. So we're making about $1.40 a record. You went down to a 70 cent deal, seven point deal. So now you, you just gave away my half. That's what they thought of me, of all putting it down, spending my money, penitentiary chances to do your record, and you, that's what you thought. We just give that back to the company. So if you give half your money away, you think you was on job, what, 11 years to finish five albums, which was ridiculous? You could have been finished in half the time. You gave away half the money. So... I'm like, I never could have just, I couldn't place that. Because um, to me, you got to hate somebody to give up money. Or they weren't thinking about what they was giving up. But the minute you tell me my deal is cut in half, I'll be like, whoa, whoa, we can deal with him. And I didn't just gave you a 50-50 deal? Yeah. What artist was it? Now you is really my partner. But I'm going, my mind, I was like, yeah, I'll make you 50-50. I'm going to work the shit out of y'all. I'm getting tracks. And I already had to cut a deal with Jive because Jive didn't want them, the, they didn't want Pregnant P and they didn't want the mother was mine. So I bought it back. Hmm. Jive said, if this work out and you like it, every time we don't want the songs, we'll let you buy the songs back. Hmm. How, so much, I, how much are you buying these songs back at the time? I bought saying? those back for $15,000, two songs. Hmm. And Jive didn't, Jive was like, I'm like, what y'all going to do with it? Like, we're going to just shelf it. I, I'm willing to bet you money right now. Whatever, whoever got the masters from Jive, there is at least a full album or two of songs that they didn't use. No oh, shit. Yeah, because you remember, I don't know if you ever, you ever heard the song they did with Ron C from Dallas? I know what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it was, that they did a song with a big mic I never heard. They did a song that was the, rem the, the part two of Pocket Full of Stones called uh, Mac Man. It was, and I remember the hook because it was, uh, it was a blues singer or something. Mac Man cruising down the ghetto streets with a pocket full of money. That's steel jamming. You know how long ago I heard that demo? Yeah. But I used to smash this chick 
<laughs> and I went to sleep with that demo in my shoe. And the, her roommate was smashing the dude. They had this little fishing, see? And my tape came up missing. Oh, shit. And it, it's amazing. I know exactly who, who stole it. I never saw him no more. But he played, he worked at the box as a DJ. Played a song called Groupies with the Al Green samples. Because we was recording when we was uh, making Pocket Full of Stones. Pimp C recorded that song. And it was a song called Groupies. Our dad came up missing. He played it on the radio. And then he couldn't play it but once or twice. I'm sure Job got it pulled. And uh, that that demo with the, about the Mac was in the... And it was like, man, it was shit like that happened all the time to me. Because I just wouldn't keep up with that stuff. Yeah. But it was just it was just bad. But that was the worst pill to swallow about that, man. Just always just the the craziness of people say something in your face but then they get around the other side and they feel something different you know so so when they're doing it when they start to work on a uh, super tight you're not involved with any of the recording process i wouldn't let myself go i never asked to go i never did nothing i said I are don't y'all wanna... talking at this time no hmm. no we're not talking at all but i'm at my under what i'm thinking is i didn't made you partners Y'all get paid from Jive. I get my check. I don't got to be here. The deal we worked on is done. It was for five albums. We haven't did but one. And they were okay with that? They still weren't expecting you to still be involved even though y'all, you know. I don't know, but I think Byron Hill, that just gave him more time to be. Because even when we was in shooting the video and Byron started getting it, Pimp came to me and he said, man, Russ, keep, keep this dude away from us, man. I don't like it. He just keeps saying all this stuff. I don't, man, keep me away from him. And I was like, Okay, but at when we went to that video shoot, it was like so much stuff going on, and and I had came with my girl, so I'm just chilling, you know, eating, ordering room service, and um, I'm like, you shooting a video, bro? So I go to watch these long hours of this video shoot that I'm not feeling because I just felt like the video wasn't really what we, you know. Did y'all was, have a vision already, and they came? We with got something the to vision okay. board, but it was the first one we saw. Yeah. It wasn't the first one we saw. It was the one, it was our first time seeing a vision board. But what they were shooting, I never felt like that was going to get played. And I understand, you know, back then the videos was a fortune. So when when you realize you're spending $80,000, you're like, well, maybe it's going to get played. But no, nah, it didn't. You know, it's even years later before I even saw the video. And it was like, I was remembering it like, dang, I didn't even remember we did, we shot that. But, you know, but y'all did uh, what was it? Use me up. Y'all had to use me, me up. up. I didn't go. I didn't go. Y'all. So y'all were already into I, it by then. Yeah, we was into it, but use me up. That was the second video for that. By then, we full fledged not speaking. Damn. And and then I'm spending all these legal fees fighting. I'm fighting. And then people would be like, people would have thought from the way it was that they was off. But I didn't sign. I didn't release UGK until 1998. And I I just was tired. Because you, you're fighting a big million to billion dollar company, they just keep you tied up. And that's what they do. And I would always tell people, every time we have to deal with this, it just slows up the other work. Because you know, we still had other artists. We were still trying to do stuff. It just was like a headache. And so in 1998, we was just about to go to court. And uh, they, it was right before they dropped their they album or they was in their renegotiation with Jive or something. But they needed me to be out the picture. Hmm. And so I went, uh, me and McNice, who was my, my chief officer at that point, we, we went down to PA. And uh, when we got to PA, the, uh, Dan Zucker, the business affairs um, dude from Jive was there. Jeff Finster was there, the a &R. But you know, Dan is really a lawyer. I didn't bring my lawyer. I'm like, these lawyers just talking, making money. I'm going. And 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 I could have I could have you talk to McKnight. He was right there with me. I was doing it. I, I was telling them what I wanted. I said this is what I want. I want to override. And then I said I want to override with no deductions. And so they came up with if we'll give you an override, a two percent override on the records, the next two records. But they gotta go go. They they always throw those little catches in there on you. Yeah. They gotta go go. But at this time. This is, I'm it's, like, okay, they went gold and riding dirty. I'm like, oh, we got this. No, they didn't go gold. Hmm. And then I was like, okay, they didn't go gold list. That record stopped. And what the record companies do is they would always hold you to the sound scan. You know, 
the record stopped at 447,000 units on SoundScan. I don't get paid till 500,001. Yeah, yeah. So, I, but I threw, with everything they threw at me, I had my plan of how to do it. So I said, I want a remix to Like Yesterday. I want a brand new track from Pimp for me to use for however I want. And I want them to do a remix to uh, something else. I had asked for three or four tracks. And they said, yeah. And mm. they signed the thing. So I'm like, okay. So it don't matter about this, this. The points don't matter about the money. So I got two points on the next two albums. And I got I got the songs. So yeah, I never thought that I would ever have to see another man try to say that. that mm-hmm. PSK. No yeah. shit. Yep. I asked for the That's remix a classic. Man, I love this yeah, song, man. I, I like that song. I thought it never did. That's another story. I think it never did what it should have did because... You know, they came in, they recorded that fucking song. And this is this is when we beefing. So I'm thinking this is the beginning of like us being good. Pimp and them. Man, I Pimp made the beat right too, Pimp right? Made that beat. Yeah. Bun did the hook. We recorded it the next morning, about eight o'clock in the morning. I remember it. I'm sleeping in my bed, with my girl. I'm like, damn it. Y'all had the session, everything cool. Yeah. <laughs> everything. We recorded it. It's yeah. done. Miss West on the phone. Said, hey, Russell. Hey, baby. How you doing? She always soften you up. She she was able to pull that mama card good. Because every black male. It's going to always be respect. It's mama. For, yeah. for mama. It's a, it's a, but it's, when you're in a lawsuit or in a battle with somebody, that's the worst person you have to talk to. Somebody mama. Because you always going to have respect for a mama. It would have been better if I'm talking to a father. I'd be like, man, you know. You know what you can do. Yeah. <laughs> she said, baby, hey, how you doing? Everything went good to sis? I said, it was great. You like the song? Yeah. She said, oh, I'm so glad. That's so great. Well, Pimp charges 5000 for a track. He rapped on it, so he charged 5000 to rap. And Bun got to get 5000 to rap to. So this song that you volunteered to come do with me, Supposed to be like this peace offering, and we, you know, has turned into now. I owe y'all fifteen thousand dollars the next morning. Damn. I was pissed. I was pissed. I remember. I was like, man, fuck them dudes, man. I'm sick of them dudes. Fuck them. And uh, I told Miss West, I said, no, I'm not giving them fifteen thousand. And I said, you know me. I already got the fucking song. So, what you gonna do now? I said, but I'm trying to keep the peace. I said, I give them, I cut everything down. I said, I'll give you 10 G's. So I paid 10 G's for that song. Hmm. And I was, from there on, I was like, I don't care who I talk to with them. I don't care who I deal with. I know what it, all, it actually is. And, you know, after we settled with Jive, I got $85,000 to sign. To sign the release. And, and, what, and what year was this? This was 1998. Hmm. This is 1998. 90, I'm like, okay, it's good because I'm going to make a million off the tracks yeah. and the song. And I know they're going to go to platinum on one of these records. Yeah. Man, let me tell you about people that fuck you. Major labels will fuck. It's so smooth how they fuck me. I, I'm amazed at it. I can't do nothing but tip my hat.